Man, why do I feel like we're breaking and entering? Because we're going to jail. This is why people don't want to get married. When people want to get married, gay people. Is this a game you want to play with me? Of course, we had to do the sequel. Why Did I Get Married Too picks right back up with the group, except this time while they're on vacation in the sunny Bahamas. But the change in scenery doesn't equal a good time. While a few of them are rekindling their romance, like newlyweds, Troy and Sheila, the other couples end up in even messier situations than before. Affairs, violence, lies, public humiliation, and divorce play the couples yet again. And as always, while watching this movie, I noticed some things. But before we talk about that, it's time to recap. So let's get into it. So the movie starts with us getting reacquainted with the couples again. First, we catch up with Terry and Diane. I guess Terry finally broke Diane down cause now they have the second child he wanted oh so badly. <laughs> but everything seems to be better with them now. We also get a peek into Marcus's glow up as a sportscaster. Love that for him. Terry and Diane are heading off to another couple's retreat, but before they head out, they have to explain some things. Unwillingly, of course, to their kids about divorce when Troy and Sheila are brought up. They tried to give them the PG version of what divorce was, but their daughter already knew what was up. It's when two married people break up because they hate each other. They split up their children, house, and their money. They fight over everything, and whoever has the best lawyer wins. Soon after, they head off to the airport to meet up with the other couples. Before the other couples show up, Terry compliments Diane's glow. Diane says it's due to her looking forward to this couple's retreat since there will be no drama with the couples, like it was last time. But she must have forgotten about Angela and Marcus. And if she did, she was quickly reminded because as always, we hear them before we see them and they are already arguing up a storm. Listen, me personally, I wouldn't invite them nowhere. You hear me? Nowhere. Terry and Marcus go off to check on the status of their flight while Diane tries to set the tone of the trip with Angela. And Angela notices and compliments Diane on her glow. This comes up a couple of times. Mm-hmm. But as Terry and Marcus are checking on their flight, this attendant who looks like a cross between Savannah James and Melody Thornton starts fangirling over Marcus. And it took 2.3 seconds before Angela noticed and came over to squash this shit. Y'all got time? Yeah, go ahead, get her number, Marcus. You wanna write a number down? Thank you. Go ahead, Thank write you. a number down. Again, I wouldn't invite them nowhere. Sheila and Troy are the first couple to make it to the retreat. They have recently moved down to Atlanta to be close to family and friends. And since the move, Troy hasn't been able to find a job. They spent their last to come on this trip, which is Troy stressing, while Sheila tries her best to keep him in a positive mindset. It's not working, no. This is what we need. We need a job. Patricia and Gavin arrive soon after and they greet Sheila. Gavin hurries off to join Troy out on the jet skis while Sheila and Patricia catch up. It was all of two seconds before the topic of babies came up and it's still a sore subject for Patricia who quickly changes the subject. Sheila informs Patricia that Troy hasn't been able to find a job since they moved and she feels like it's her fault since she suggested that they leave Colorado. Patricia tells her that things will get better over time and of course, Angela and Marcus announce their arrival with their bickering again. They, along with Terry and Diane, have finally arrived. Patricia and Sheila also compliment Diane on her glow and Patricia also notes that she hasn't seen her glow like this since her and Terry first started dating. Mm-hmm. And we are introduced to the newish issue within Angela and Marcus's marriage. Angela thinks that Marcus thinks he's hot shit because he's a sportcaster and people recognize him. Child, first she was mad because he didn't have a job. Now she's mad because he got one. Never satisfied. But we go to the guys outside on the jet skis. 
The guys congratulate Marcus on his show and then the conversation quickly turns to his messy ass marriage. Marcus states how Angela hates the fact that he's working and that she may have issues. Man, you know something? I think Angela's got a problem. You think? Marcus brings up how Angela argues just to have makeup sex later and Terry got a little weird. I bet your ghetto ass till I beat me there to punch this nipple, punch it. <laughs> Meanwhile, the girls are catching up inside. Angela brings up how Patricia's book starts most of her arguments with Marcus. Patricia stated in her book how she doesn't go into her husband's phone because she trusts him. So Angela requests Marcus's passcode to his phone because she don't trust him. And it starts an argument every single time. And while the ladies are giggling and having a good time, in comes an unexpected guest. Mike has entered the building to the shock of everyone. Apparently, Mike owns part of their timeshare and he also conveniently saw that everyone booked this time to meet up and took it upon himself to join them. Even though he's no longer married to Sheila, knows she's now married to Troy, and that his presence is gonna make things really awkward. And you already know Angela was not for it. Uh, oh, hell no! Oh, hell no, Mike, what are you doing here? Oh. This Negro got some nerve. Mike goes down to meet the fellas and Troy was not for the mess. His guard instantly goes up. One thing that I noticed is, when it comes to Mike, none of the guys correct him. They laugh, tell him to cut it out, but they don't confront him and tell him about his actions. Troy puts him in his place though, as he should. Congratulations on the baby. So, you name Mike Jr.? Nah, man, but you know, you might've been able to do that had you taken care of your business the first time. The husbands go off to check on their wives and everybody's upset. Patricia suggests that they leave and find somewhere else to stay. And Sheila blurts out how her and Troy have spent their last to be there. Terry and Gavin calm the group down by saying that they shouldn't let him ruin their vacation. Troy asks Sheila to come upstairs to talk and it turns out he's pissed at her for bringing up how they spent their last to come on this trip. Now I get that this was a pride thing, not wanting the group to know their personal business and plus these are Sheila's friends and not his. However, with Mike in the mix, Troy's really pissed about her bringing it up to the group cause if Mike's petty ass gets a hold of this info, you already know what's gonna happen. But Troy makes Sheila promise not to bring their financial situation up to the group moving forward. Later, we go out to Terry, Gavin, Mike, and Marcus out fishing. And Marcus is lying up a storm. Last time I was here, I caught a fish that was 13 feet long, know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mike still believes, somehow, <laughs> that Sheila misses him and even asks the fellas if she acts about him. Mike admits that he misses her and Terry warned him not to start shit on their trip. And then Gavin's messy ass, and he's usually not this messy. I would have expected this from Marcus, not him. But he brings up the fact that Troy doesn't have a job to Mike. You already know this will come up later. Marcus tells him that Sheila never brings him up and Mike doubts him. But being that Marcus has an inner lie detector, he quickly learns the truth. Did she talk to Angela about me? No. Like, never. Wow. I mean, you were. How big was the fish? 13 feet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Sheila never talks to Angela about me. No. They had to do a control test <laughs> to confirm this dude wasn't lying. They are a trip. But back at the house, the girls are getting some self-care and chatting about Sheila and Troy's argument earlier. Child, somewhere along the line, Angela starts rambling about how when men get jobs, they change. And it got really personal. And then when he gets a job, he's gonna start talking back to you and staying out late all the time and telling you how much money he's making. The girls confront her about complaining about him not having a job, him getting one, and then her still not being happy now that he has one. A good one at that. Angela obviously has insecurity and control issues, but she knows that while her mess is all out in the open, the other ladies have things going on in their marriage as well, and she's determined to expose the mess. Later that night, the couples get together outside to play spades. 
Troy and Sheila are playing against Marcus and Angela and they're having a good time. The others are looking on. Mike starts meddling with Troy and Sheila, making comments on Troy's hand, saying how he doesn't know how to play, and these subtle shots are leading to the big one, slowly but surely. How's life in Atlanta? Life is good, thank you. I was talking to him. And she was talking to you, you know because what, Angela. And Angela is trying to get Mike together per usual, but eventually he takes it there. How's the job search? I'm not the kind of cat that's gonna sit here and act like I like you, cause I don't. Do yourself a favor. Sit there, nurse your little fruit juice, and leave me and mine the hell alone. Dude said, nurse your little fruit juice. <laughs> and Sheila was turned on by that. She was like, my man, my man, my man. But after this, the mood was brought down and everyone went into the house. And it wasn't long before Angela started up with Marcus about this damn phone password. So Marcus gave her a bone. Or so she thought. Password to my cell phone is G-O, the number two, A-T-E-L-L. She really thought she was getting this password. Girl, bye. Then we go to Terry and Diane. Terry brings up how he noticed that Gavin and Patricia were distant all night. Diane says they should talk to Patricia later and make sure things are good. And then Terry tries to set the mood and Diane seems like she's into it. Until. Phil. Who's Phil? <laughs> when questioned by Terry, Diane tries to clean up her mistake by saying she meant to say that she was about to feel the tub. Girl, you're gonna have to lie better than that. And Terry knew she was with the mess. And Sheila and Troy are still bickering. Sheila is taking the fact that Troy is pissed at her very personal. Him being angry and seemingly shutting her out is triggering her and she doesn't know how to handle it. You know what, if this is too much for you to deal with, go, Troy, go. What the hell are you talking about? And Angela and Marcus are still doing what they do best. Their little argument is amping up, so Marcus decides to initiate the one thing he knows will shut her up. And they, well. Yeah. We go back to Troy and Sheila. Troy tells Sheila that he feels insecure now, that he's not able to provide for her like he's used to. And they both admit that it's hard loving someone who's been through a bad relationship, but they both insist that they remain dedicated to their marriage. Later on, while Terry and Diane are in bed, they overhear Gavin and Patricia arguing. When Diane goes to check on her, of course, Patricia denies that she and Gavin are going through things. Diane tries to get Patricia to open up, but she refuses and shuts her out. Diane warns her that she will lose her mind trying to keep everything in which foreshadows the turn she takes later. It gets really interesting. The next morning, Sheila gets up to cook Troy breakfast. Mike was already in the kitchen chilling and took this opportunity to talk to her. He tries to bring up old memories to open her up, but instead, for Sheila, it brings up a traumatic memory instead. Well, you painted the kitchen orange, you remember that? It was yellow. I remember it because of that hole in the wall, the one when you pushed me into it. My nose bled on it, and for the life of me, I couldn't get that blood up. Hearing this makes Mike remorseful for all he put Sheila through. He tries to apologize to her, but Sheila isn't open to it and kicks him out the kitchen. I know this trip was so emotionally exhausting for her. There's a lot to deal with on a vacation. Later, the girls sit out on the beach. While Angela is getting her Baywatch on, she gets the shock of her life when she's covered with somebody's ashes out the blue. I'm so sorry. It's wind. The wind just took it away. Oh, please forgive us, but these are her ashes. <laughs> I would have lost my mind. And her friends are busy having a conversation with these people while their friend is fighting with the dead out in the ocean. A mess. It turns out the ashes belong to a friend of this couple, Ola and Porter. But the ladies invite the lovely couple to come by later that night for dinner as they share their why did I get married stories. So later that night, the couple share their stories as they sit around the fire. And why is Mike here? Dude is just inviting himself to every function. <laughs> he was hating from the sidelines as they went up to tell their love story. Mike was over there looking all sad and full of regret, 
Honestly, Richard T. Jones was awesome at wearing his emotions on his face. You could see and feel his remorse. Dude wanted that old thing back. Since Marcus and Angela opted out of telling their stories and Patricia and Gavin were ducking and dodging the spotlight, next up on the podium were the special guests of the evening, Ola and Porter. Their story was interesting. They fell in love when they were younger, he went off to war, they both married other people, but eventually they found one another again and now are living there happily ever after. We see the interactions of the couples and Mike as their love story is being told. Patricia and Gavin barely want to hold hands. Diane barely wants to kiss Terry. Angela and Marcus finally soften and Mike looks even sadder than before. Then it's finally time for Patricia and Gavin to tell their story and it does not go as planned. At least not for Gavin. Gavin and I have decided to get a divorce. He really found out he was getting a divorce at the same time as everyone else. I never noticed this before, that he wasn't expecting her to say that. He still thought they had a chance and was prepared to fight for them. This marks the end of the trip. We fast forward to Patricia and Gavin working on their divorce. Patricia is back to playing the perfect patty role while Gavin is bitter, so bitter that he's chosen to go for blood. Gavin's lawyer brings up an account not mentioned that holds Patricia's book profits. Patricia makes it clear that the money from her book sales should not be part of the divorce, but Gavin is not trying to hear that. What page did you write, Gavin? What book tour lecture were you on? What ID you gonna use, Lewis? How you gonna pay for these court fees, Lewis? If you come get Leah right now, where's she gonna go, Lewis? Gavin is over playing the role of the dedicated husband. He wants his reparations for putting up with the facade. When you announced that we were getting divorced in front of all our friends, you never ran that by me, okay? Everything is always private with us. Since the first movie, Patricia has been trying to be the perfect image, despite the trauma she went through. Always wanting to be the person who has it all together and knows what to say, what to do, how to fix X, Y, and Z, but it seems like all that is ending here because Gavin is done. And I've been waiting for you to learn how to love me. Patricia is overwhelmed at this point and leaves out. Diane is shocked at all this because this is the total opposite of what she's known when it comes to them. And the sad part is, it's gonna get even uglier than this. We go to Angela, who is having a little talk with her neighbor. Her neighbor called her over to tell her that she's been hearing love noises that were a bit too loud for her liking. And Angela was confused by this because she wasn't home around the time these noises were happening. Miss Tannenbaum, I work all day during the week, so... Well, if you're at work, who is it that's making all that... Oh my child we already know where this is about to go <laughs> we go to sheila and troy troy had an interview but unfortunately for him it didn't go well he was overqualified sheila tells troy that they could just borrow money from one of her friends to help them stay on their feet and troy was not with it he's much too proud for that as he tries to go upstairs and get a moment to himself, Sheila tries to follow after him and talk to him, but Troy didn't want that. Troy! Damn it, Sheila, give me some space! Don't you ever talk to me like that again. They are clashing real bad. Between Sheila's insecurity, trauma, and fear, and his pride, things are not going smoothly. Then we go to Terry and Diane. Diane finally makes it home, and baby, she's got a little pep in her step. Despite Gavin and Patricia's disastrous meeting earlier, she comes in and kisses her daughter, rubs her son's head. I wonder if she resents him. But Terry asks about Patricia and Gavin. Diane doesn't go into details, but she does suggest that he checks up on Gavin later. Diane brought in some flowers along with everything else, and as Terry looks at the flowers, he noticed a card holder in it and questions Diane about it. You must have had a really great day at work. Just come with the card? No. Oh. There's a stick for a card. Diane awkwardly lies and tries to brush it off, but you already know Terry has filed this instance in his brain, and this is definitely coming up later. 
We go to Angela's neighbor who's babysitting the kids for her. They decide to watch their dad on TV and poor babies, they didn't know they were about to see one hell of a show. Angela has made her way to the station while this man is live on TV. Live. Lady, we're live. I don't give a damn about you being live. How you doing, Rodney? Marcus, who the hell have you had at my house, huh? Their son looks so disappointed. <laughs> I would be too. And that poor neighbor probably felt guilty as hell, but she shouldn't though. This type of fuckery was gonna happen with or without her help. But I mean, she is going in. Marcus is nasty behind, has the nerve to have some holes with them little what wide receivers <laughs> with them tight ends. Child, Marcus carried her off the stage and his cast members hurried to commercial break so they can spy and be nosy. As Angela continues to go off, talking about how he's cheating and all that, Marcus is reminded of one thing. You're trying to make me lose my job. I don't give a damn about this job. You're about to lose your wife and your kids. You're so damn evil. Yeah, you now, Angela, you dragged this man for not having a job. He has one now, a good one at that. And this job is carrying y'all while your hair salon is going through it because of the recession and you take your happy ass to the set to confront him, putting this job at risk. You know you wrong, but we'll talk about that later. But Marcus gives her his cell phone along with the password she's been begging for this whole time, which was her birthday of all things, and storms off before he loses his damn job and his mind. And check out his nosy coworkers. I'll see you later. Yeah, what y'all doing, you little nosy I'm ass? Just going over notes. Sport just doing people. notes. We go to Patricia and Gavin, who are still living under the same roof. I don't see why they thought this was a good decision, but Gavin's been drinking and he is in his feelings and he has one request. Give me the money. And of course, Patricia wants to act like this isn't happening and tries to go upstairs, but Gavin brought her ass right back down. No more running from reality, not on his watch. This scene was intense, but one thing I can say is, Patricia had been running from reality and her emotions for a very long time. She basically shut them off to protect herself. But instead of cutting the emotions that were tied to just her son and the loss of him, which is still not okay, she cut off emotions for her husband too. And when Gavin did this, she finally broke. Get ready y'all. The real Patty is about to make an entrance. Sheila pulls a bird move, you know, like bird from waiting to excel and asks her ex-husband to help her new husband find a job. This never, ends well. Now, Mike was hoping that she would want to talk about anything else other than Troy, but unfortunately, that was a no. Sheila's happy that he agreed to help, but immediately feels guilty and suspicious of Mike's willingness to help. Mike tells her that after everything he's done, he just wants to do better, and Sheila still doesn't believe him, but since she needs his help, I guess she didn't have a choice but to. We go to Angela and Diane. They are waiting for the other ladies to arrive for lunch. Child, Angela has went viral and is being recognized by this guy. Is that you on Sports Shuffle? You know what, shuffle that food down your fat ass throat and leave me the hell alone, okay? And mind your business. Much. What's he talking about? Absolutely nothing. Thanks. It's crazy how Diane didn't know what Angela did and how Angela didn't want to tell her. Even Angela knew she went too far. She wasn't gonna admit it to them though. Sheila arrives shortly after and the conversation changes to Angela thinking that Marcus is cheating yet again. And Diane's guilt slips out with this one. How do you really know that your spouse is cheating anyway? I mean, really. Mm-hmm. But Angela goes on to say that every time she suspected Marcus of cheating, he was actually cheating. So she always trusts the voices in her head. Yeah, but you smoke so much weed in college. <laughs> Baby, you might not want to listen to that voice in your head. But Sheila does make a good suggestion by saying if Angela is always drinking, then she may want to put down the wine glass to make sure she's seeing things clearly. And then Sheila reminds Angela that relationships are supposed to be about trust. But Angela doesn't want to hear none of that. Now, I'm an old school fool. I'm checking his bank statements. I'm checking his credit card statements. I'm checking his time card at work and I'm comparing it. This chick is psychotic. 
And then Sheila had the nerve to ask her this, not knowing she had the answer to that too. Do you check his pulse when he walks through the door? His resting heart rate is 42 beats a minute. Angela is going to drive herself crazy trying to keep Marcus in line. It's best to just let it go at this point. Their relationship is dangerous for both of their health. <laughs> After Patricia misses their lunch, the ladies go to her house and try to check on her. But baby, Patricia is deep in those feelings that she's been dodging for quite some time now. Sheila makes it home and surprise, Troy's got a job offer. Shocker. Now Sheila's feeling even more guilty about getting Mike's help. I don't know what I'd do without you. Next day, the fellas come by to help Gavin move some items. First off, this dude is sitting on the steps of his own house and hesitating to go in. Red flag. Then he does this. You changed the locks. And then Terry and Marcus go in after him. Child, I'd be like, look, what is going on? Cause I'm not getting in your mess. But Gavin begs them to help him get his stuff out before Patricia comes back to the house. She don't know about this? Duh, you just saw this man throw a planner at this door to get in his own house. What are you not getting? And if things couldn't get worse. Man, why do I feel like we're breaking and entering? Because we're going to jail. This is why people don't want to get married. When people want to get married, gay people. Is this the game you want to play with me? They weren't expecting that. And baby, Patricia goes clean off, smashing up tables, decor, and everything else before telling them to get out of her house. Listen, Perfect Patty has officially snapped. We go to Sheila meeting up with Mike again. Her guilt is driving her mad and she comes in hot, going off on Mike, telling him if he plans to hold him, helping Troy over her head, then he can forget about it. Mike tries to calm her down, but it doesn't work until she tries to leave and he grabs her arm. Sheila knew instantly that something was wrong. Then we go to Angela, who's made some time in her Tuesday schedule to come by the house and investigate those noises her neighbor was telling her about. And her neighbor was so missed. Sounds like he's really giving it to her. Yeah, and I'm about to give it to both of them. And boy, was she in for a surprise when she opened her bedroom door. Alex! <laughs> Alex! That was my baby! Oh, hell no! How is this lady not in jail right now? <laughs> then we go to Terry and Diane. Terry watches Diane get her work clothes together. He notices the brand new panties and bra she picks out and decides to confront her about things that he's noticed. It all started with the glow. Then he went to her clothes. Then her calling him Phil, the flowers, and now her wearing lingerie to work. So it had to be addressed. Honestly, if Terry had waited one more day, I fear it would have been too late. But he confronts Diane and she admits to being attracted to one of her co-workers and basically having an emotional affair, which was dangerously close to being an all-out affair. Diane insists that she loves Terry and their family, but girl, let's call a thing a thing. You don't love him like that. Y'all just got history and he just wanted those kids to slow you down, which didn't work. So honestly, why are y'all even doing this? Anyway, Marcus finally makes it home and Angela wasted no time getting the party started. So you working late again, Marcus? She starts off complaining about how his phone's been ringing off the hook, but the password he gave isn't working. As she's explaining this, the phone goes off and she proves just how ignorant she truly is. And I hear you breathing. When you gonna say something, ho? You cannot answer a text message by picking up the phone. That is ridiculous. Some old stupid phone that can't nobody work. Maybe it ain't the phone that's stupid. Child, she opens the phone and looks through the text and realizes those sounds she heard were notifications of text from his job. Now she wants to play nice and apologize again. Instant divorce. This marriage is not good for their mental health. This is way too much. But just as Angela gets soft and starts apologizing, here comes the bullshit. I'm tired. What's that? Marcus! What are you doing with another cell phone, Marcus? I, we 
go to Troy, who finds out from his coworker that he was recommended for the job by Mike as a favor from Sheila. Troy immediately asks for Mike's address. I mean, he wasted no time. He goes straight to Mike and Sheila opened the door. Baby, it went south from there. He jacks up Mike out his sleep and starts yelling at both Sheila and Mike. Sheila was there to take Mike to chemo. Mike has cancer. Honestly, somebody else could and should have took him. You are not his wife and that is not your job. You put your marriage at risk, but she did. And now Troy thinks the worst and he doesn't want to hear anything she has to say. Sometime later, the girls go to check on Patricia. The broken door and other evidence from the altercation earlier that day are still there. And Patricia is sitting on those steps. Again, feeling those feelings, she's been ducking and dodging. The girls try to talk to her, but she refuses to move or engage and insists that they leave. The girls don't feel comfortable leaving, so they convince her to let them stay as long as they don't talk and just keep her company. I wouldn't have left either. I would have felt horrible if something happened after I left. But then we go to the guys, Terry, Marcus, Gavin, and Mike at the bar catching up. Terry was telling the guys about his and Diane's latest issue. Gavin and Mike ironically try to convince him to work it out with Diane and tell him that divorce shouldn't be an option. And Terry ain't trying to hear it. Shortly after, Troy shows up to apologize to Mike about what happened, which is very big of him. Mike tells Troy that he doesn't have anything to worry about with Sheila and that he can and should trust his wife. The guys ask Mike why he never told them he was sick and Mike insists that he will beat cancer and he'll be okay. I think Mike said this to protect their feelings. I think he knew something different. But Mike is determined to keep the peace moving forward. He even invites Troy to sit and drink with them. And then we get to this part. Child, Patricia woke up and decided to still choose violence. So she goes to Gavin's job and acts like she has a birthday surprise for him. So she sets it up to be a big thing with his huge cake in the middle of the floor, but... <laughs> What is with this friend group and coming up to each other's jobs and embarrassing each other? Like what is going on? But Gavin wasn't going for it and tries to leave and get away from the situation, which turned out to be a fatal choice. So do we want to say it? I'll say it. Technically, Patricia unintentionally killed her son and her husband. Damn. But Later on at the hospital, Patricia realizes all that she's done and realizes it wasn't worth it. She encouraged the other couples to fix their relationships before it was too late. Gavin ends up dying and sometime later, all the couples plus Mike go back to the Bahamas and say their final farewell to Gavin. One year later, Patricia is doing better, back to her day to day. One of her colleagues suggests that she meet someone now she sets this up like, oh, it's been a year and you need to get back out there and find your person. But in reality, dude was a donor and they needed funding. So she was trying to pull a two for one and basically pimp her out. But I, when I'm Patricia so sorry to saw bombard him, you this way. she was down I'm for Daniel the cause. Franklin. And I was also wondering if you thought it would be too forward if I asked you out to get some coffee. Sir, listen to me. You need to run fast because a year is not long enough for the intensive healing she needs, <laughs> okay? But that's the end of the movie, and here are my final thoughts. Honestly, all these couples need to get divorced, except for Sheila and Troy. This sequel revealed more things about these couples that served as proof that they didn't stand a chance. Let's start with the one couple that I feel could work out, Sheila and Troy. While I believe that Sheila and Troy are good for one another, I don't think that Sheila gave herself enough time to heal her traumas. The trauma she experienced with Mike, him cheating with her best friend, him being abusive, him being a toxic asshole, was bleeding over into her new relationship. The lines where Sheila said, the hardest thing for a woman to do is have a good man after a bad one. And when Troy said the hardest thing to do is to love a woman after she's been loved badly, that is very true. 
Sheila needed therapy or at least time to sort through her experience with Mike and heal so that she didn't carry those fears into her new relationship. Troy was so good with her, patient, kind, but he did have a pride issue. I can understand him not wanting people in their business, especially people that he doesn't personally know who are also connected to his wife's ex-husband. But if they need the help and the help is there, just take it. That's what community is for. And since we can't talk about Sheila and Troy without bringing up Mike, child, Mike showed up to the couple's retreat with no shame. I'm not sure what he was expecting. He knew Sheila and Troy were married, had recently had a baby, and he had the nerve to show up asking if she thought about him or brought him up. And it was mighty funny, but not really. How now that he was sick and down, he wanted to apologize to Sheila. Why did he think he deserved her presence still after everything he'd done? It was cool of him to help Troy out with a job, but even that good gesture came with a cost of sorts. Him asking Sheila to help him and Sheila being the good person she is decides to. You can forgive somebody or feel empathy for someone without allowing them to be in your presence. I'm sure Mike could have called on a family member, a friend, or hired a care nurse since he was so well off, it didn't have to be Sheila. I felt kinda bad for Mike in the end. Sadly, it took something as devastating as cancer to make him remorseful and see what an asshole he had been to not only Sheila, but to everybody. Now on to Terry and Diane. Now, some of y'all felt like I was too light on Diane in the first review. Y'all didn't know that I was gonna do the sequel then, and child, we are going to talk about her. Terry and this doomed dad's marriage. As I said before, Diane and Terry shouldn't have been together. Their wants differed greatly and they were simply not aligned. You had Terry who was family oriented and wanted a big family. And you had Diane who was super career focused and anything outside of that just wasn't a priority. Terry was trying his best to force his wants onto her, and Diane was trying her best to make Terry see that she just didn't want that traditional role. They shouldn't even have made it to the sequel. I believe Terry and Diane stayed together for comfort, and not because they truly loved each other. And maybe this was more on Diane's end because she was two seconds away from risking it all for Phil. She started to dress sexier, wear lingerie under her work clothes, and had a little glow going on all the things that she wouldn't and couldn't do for Terry. I think she had fallen out of love with that man and was checking out. Diane wanted to be a rich auntie basically and Terry tried to convince her or force her to want what he wanted to be the traditional wife and mother but in the end even after untying her tubes which was so wild to me. But after all that Diane was still not gonna be who or what he wanted her to be. They just needed to accept that and move on. There is no fixing that. On to Angela and Marcus. Now, I loved Angela in the first movie, but the Angela in the sequel was too fucking much. Now, ma'am, you fussed about Marcus not having a job, him not being able to pay the bills, him not doing enough. And then when he finally gets the job, you're not mad at the fact that he's getting so much attention, how he thinks he's really doing something, how you can't control him like you used to now that the roles are reversed and your shop is suffering due to the recession. Is this not what you wanted? Is this not what you asked for? Angela showed her insecurities in this sequel. Marcus being on his shit, having a good job and being the provider scared her because she felt like he had the upper hand and could move how he wanted to, being that he was no longer dependent on her. This girl showed up to his job, again, the same job that she begged for him to get, cussing him out live on air, that could have been detrimental to his career after that. You put him in danger of never being able to work in the business again because of your hurt feelings. Like girl, just divorce his ass and move on if this is what you gotta do every six months. But did y'all peep how Marcus had a second phone that Angela knew nothing about? You think he's still cheating? I say hell yeah he was. Like I said, instant divorce hot grits. Angela was up here checking his rest and heart rate, bank statements, credit card statements, and car mileage. If it ever gets to the point where you have to do any of that, baby, 
It's simply not worth it. And finally, on to Patricia and Gavin. Something I noticed in the dinner scene from the first movie was that Mike had tea on Gavin, but nobody had the tea on Patricia because she wasn't telling nobody any of her messy business. Patricia had gone through one of the hardest things you could ever go through, the loss of a child, and that loss broke her. So much so that to move on with life, she shut off any emotions tied to that loss and that bled over into her marriage. While Gavin wanted to lean on his wife and work through the loss together, because Patricia was stuck and unwilling to work through that loss with him, it was like they were both unable to get to the other side of that. Gavin wanted to be vulnerable with her, talk about it, cry about it, but Patricia didn't want to acknowledge the loss due to her feeling like it was her fault. And her being a therapist, she thought she could fix herself, but she was sliding deeper and deeper and it started to affect her marriage because again, Gavin got tired of playing the role. I believe when Gavin burned those baby pictures, it unlocked all of the feelings that were buried within Pat and they came rushing out. Patricia didn't know how to handle those feelings and that's why she had a breakdown towards the end. She was stuck in the denial stage of grief, but Gavin pushed her on into the anger stage and boy was her anger fierce. So fierce that it led to Gavin's death. I believe that if Patricia had sought therapy after that loss and worked through all the stages of grief, her and Gavin could have made it, but her stubbornness caused the end of their marriage and the end of Gavin's life. And before I forget, Gavin was wrong as hell for going after her book profits like that when she had already agreed to give him half of what they acquired during the marriage. He was just being an asshole at that point. Now, he had every reason to be one, especially after that divorce announcement, but still, that was a bit too much for me. All in all, I'm only rooting for Sheila and Finance Troy, period. But anyway, y'all, that's it for this recap. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. As for the next video, I'm gonna say is 2007, a remake full of Black Hollywood faves, an American Idol turned Oscar winner, and child, the thoughts I have about this one. <laughs> See you next time, you guys. Bye.